Well, God bless you. Welcome to the wonderful Words of Life radio program. We're going to be in Acts chapter 24 today, and we're going to be looking at the uh, defense, Paul's defense of himself before Felix, and also how that he takes uh, this situation and he use it, uses it as an opportunity to preach the gospel uh, to all those within the sound of his voice. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, we bless you today in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the Holy Spirit of truth who guides us and directs us in every affair of life. And I thank you that you're personally present in your word, hallelujah, to bring about that which you desire to be done. And we thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're in the book of Acts, chapter 24. Now, we set the stage. Paul's returned to Jerusalem, and he is recognized by some Jews in the temple, and they assume uh, that he had desecrated the temple by bringing Gentiles into the court, and they accost him. Uh, an angry mob develops. Uh, they set upon Paul to kill him. Uh, the Roman soldiers come and rescue him. Now, isn't that, isn't that a paradox? In this case, it's Roman soldiers that rescue Paul, but in a few short years, it's the Roman soldiers that execute him. What a parody. And so uh, these Roman soldiers, they carry Paul into the fortress of Antonia uh, to keep him safe. And the captain of the guard, Lysias, uh, he's going to, his purpose is to scourge Paul to get the truth out of him. But Paul he let it be known that he's a Roman citizen and he hasn't been condemned of any crime. And so the apostle, he is uh, loosed from his chains. He's uh, remanded into custody. Uh, court hearing is conducted. And uh, of course, you know, the Jews are there. Uh, they come up with a story how that uh, uh, this man was uh, worthy of death. And how that they were going to judge him according to his law. We'll read it. We'll read this here. And uh, so this hearing uh, turns into an uproar. Uh, the Sanhedrin now, they begin to dispute with each other about the guilt of Paul. Uh, the 40 Jews, remember the 40 Jews, they bound themselves uh, that they would not eat or drink until they killed Paul. Well, they still are keeping that oath. Uh, and the Sanhedrin now, they try to lay a trap for the apostle to do that very thing, but it just so happens, ha, huh, Paul's nephew just happened to overhear uh, them planning, uh, plotting to, to kill uh, the Apostle Paul. And so he goes and tells Paul, Paul summons a Roman guard, tells the guard to send the nephew to the captain, sends the captain. So now what does the captain do? Well, he summons 400 soldiers. Now here's 40 Jews. The captain summons 400 soldiers and 70 horsemen to conduct uh, the Apostle Paul uh, to Felix, uh, the governor. Oh, I'm telling you, uh, God has a way and he'll use people. Uh, he'll work through people. I don't like the word use. He'll work through people that don't even know him uh, to uh Form and to carry out his plan and his purpose. Now, he is watching over Paul until that time where Paul is ready now to give up his life. So, and this is something that Paul wrote to the Philippian church. I want to read it to you. But I would that you should understand, brethren, the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So, this is the Apostle Paul's mindset. This is exactly why he endures the things he endures, because he's doing it all for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's doing it all to glorify Christ. And I think we should do no less. Now, we have to operate within the boundaries of our calling. We can't, we can't you know, pledge to live the same kind of life and ministry of the Apostle Paul because that was his life. That was his ministry. We have a different we have a different calling. Amen. Most of us are called just to our local community. 
But if we'll have the same mindset that the Apostle Paul had, and we'll apply that mindset to, to the boundaries of our calling and our ministry, we will be success and we will glorify God. Amen. Praise God for that. All right, let's begin. Chapter 24 and verse 1. And after five days, Ananias the high priest descended with the elders and with a certain orator named Tertullus, who informed the governor against Paul. All right, now, Sanhedrin, they have five days to plan uh, what they're going to do before this hearing. And so they employ Tertullus, a Roman lawyer, perhaps a Jew, perhaps one that had uh, Roman citizenship, and he is planning to be that, according to the Jews, that excellent adversary to Paul, amen, so that the court, Roman court, will rule in their favor. All right, now verse 2. And when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Seeing that by you we enjoy great quietness, and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by your providence, we accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix. See how he's setting himself up with all thankfulness, notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto you. I pray that you would hear us of thy clemency a few words. All right. So here's this uh, Tertullus. He's buttering up. Uh, he's buttering up Felix. Amen. And so verse 5 says, and we have found this man. Now, here it begins. We have found this man, a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, who also have gone about to profane the temple whom we took and would have judged according to our law. Now, let's break this down. All right. What are the four accusations? that Tertullus levels against Paul. Well, number one, he is a pestilent fellow. What Tertullus is saying, he is a plague to this society. Amen. See, that's the wor what the world thinks of Christian believers. They're just a plague to society. I'm telling you what. We are not a plague to society. We are the light of the world through Jesus Christ. Praise God. Amen. And I want to say right here and right now, amen, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Amen. Each and every one of us who were in sin, but have now been made the righteousness of God in Christ. We have that same spirit upon us. Hallelujah. Now, if you're listening to this broadcast and you've never asked Christ to come into your heart and life, I want you to know that you are dead in trespasses and sins. You are without God godless and you are without hope hopeless. Amen. Your only hope is Christ. This is the why Christ, this is why Christ came into the world to save sinners. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. And he offers you the free gift of salvation paid for by his precious blood. When he hung on the cross, when he said it is finished, everything that he came to do, he accomplished. And the debt, your debt, not his debt, your debt, my debt, the debt of the whole world was paid, praise God. And at any time through the gospel, we can come out of this world. We can be translated out of this world system, out of the power of darkness, and we can be translated into the kingdom of his dear son. This kingdom, hallelujah, of righteousness, of peace, and of joy in the Holy Ghost. This kingdom, hallelujah, that will know no end. This kingdom, amen, that lives on the inside of every born again believer. Praise God. This kingdom that eventually will take over command of this entire globe. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. So here we're back to Paul. And this is the uh, the accusations that Tertullus levels against Paul. He called him a plague to society. And he also said that he is a mover of sedition. He is a causer of rebellion against the state, not just against the Jews, but against the entire Roman Empire. I mean, this guy is leveling, 
amen, accusations that uh, Paul is going to have to defend himself over. And he does a pretty good job, by the way. Tertullus also calls Paul a ringleader. He's a, he's a leader of the Christian rebels. This is what Christianity was looked at in the Roman Empire. They're a bunch of rebels. They're a bunch of outcasts. They don't, they're not like us. They're different. And I say praise God for it. Yes, sir. we are different. We are different than the world. Amen. Don't make excuses for it. I accept it and praise God for it. Amen. And fourthly, a profaner of the temple, a desecrator of the holy place. So here's now, here's Tertullus. And he also says that we were about to administer the proper justice according to our law. But, verse 7, the chief captain Lysias came upon us and with great violence took him away out of our hands. We were going to do away with him. But Lysias, he interrupted our plans. Verse 8, he's commanding his accusers to come unto you by examining of whom you yourself may take knowledge of all these things whereof we accuse him. And the Jews, the elders of the Sanhedrin, Ananias, the chief priest. Oh, we're going to talk about him in just a moment. And the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. Amen. So here's the Jews now. They accompanied Ananias, Ananias the high priest. He's in on it. These Jews were not of those who caught Paul in the temple. They weren't there. The Jews weren't there. The Jews that accused Paul that caused the riot, they're not there at this hearing. I mean, that's significant. And so here now we come to Paul's defense. This is in verse 10. Then Paul, after that the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that you have been of many years a judge of this nation, I do more cheerfully answer for myself, because that you may understand that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. So Paul was arrested on the seventh day. Now, Verse 12, and they neither found me in the temple disrupting with any man or disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues nor in the city. Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. But this I confess unto you, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things that are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope towards God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. This is the Apostle Paul. This is a man who ingrained into him the love of God, the love for his Savior Jesus, the love for God the Father. Amen. The, the love and the yielding of himself to the Holy Spirit. A man who had such exercised such discipline and fortitude that he had the audacity and the boldness to say that I always have and maintain a conscience that is void of offense towards God and towards men. Now, can you and I say that? Well, through forgiveness and through grace, yes, we can say that. But you and I well know that we need a greater dose of the Holy Ghost in order for us to say that I always, always maintain a conscience void of offense toward God and, and toward men. Love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. This is the fulfilling of the law and of the prophets. Praise God. Amen. Now, verse 17. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings, whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with multitude 
nor with tumult, who ought to have been here before thee and object if they had ought against me. So here we have a court hearing without witnesses. Circumstantial evidence. Here's the Sanhedrin, leaders of the Sanhedrin accusing Paul of something they themselves did not witness. Now, if the judge was an honest judge, he'd have thrown this hearing out right away. Or he'd have postponed it. He said, now you get these people, these Jews that witness what Paul was doing. You get them here and we'll, we'll once again, uh, we'll go ahead and we'll try this man, Paul. But he didn't do that, did he? Now, Paul goes on and he says this, or else let these same hearsay, if they have found any evil doing in me while I stood before the council, except it be for this one voice, this one voice. I'm telling you, believers, we in the church are calling to be one voice. Now, we may worship God a little bit differently. We may preach from behind the pulpit a little bit differently. We may conduct our services a little bit differently. But God is calling us in these last days to be one voice. Amen. Praise God. Now, once again, Verse 21, except it be for this one voice that I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question by you this day. Amen, praise God. See, one voice. That one voice speaks of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we may approach the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ from different areas. But it's the same mountain, praise God. The death, burial, and resurrection is the same mountain we're all looking at, praise God. So with one voice, we need to do what? We need to proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and get as many people born again and saved as we possibly can before the end comes. Amen. Now I want to ask you, are you preaching the gospel? Are you supporting those who preach the gospel? Are you part of a local church whose mission it is to reach their community? Well, if not, then you better be. Praise God. Make that commitment. Make that consecration from this day forward. Hallelujah. Amen. And you will see mighty changes in your household. You will see you and I will see mighty changes in our community. Praise God. Amen. Now, verse 23, uh, no, verse 22. And when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them and said, when Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty that he should forbid none of his acquaintances to minister or to come unto him. So here's Paul now. He's being kept in jail. He's being held without bond. Amen. But his purpose in life is for this. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. That is the motto that the Apostle Paul lived by. And it is also the motto that you and I are to live by. Praise God. All right, here we are in verse 24. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning, now listen to this, and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. So here is Paul using this opportunity while in bonds, while appearing before Felix and his wife Drusilla to preach the gospel. So what does Paul do? He, prevent, he presents to them what faith in Christ listens and consists of. Praise God. Amen. Now, verse 25, and as he reasoned of righteousness, of temperance, and of judgment to come, Felix trembled 
and answered, Go thy way for this time, and when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Too hot for governor. Too hot for him. Got too hot for him. Amen. Praise God. He wasn't willing to bend his heart. He wasn't willing to kneel before the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he had too much that he thought in his mind he had too much to lose. I'm telling you, that is a horrible place to be in. When you're presented with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and you're given the opportunity to bow your knee to him, repent of sin and come to Christ, accept him by faith and receive him into your heart. But that thought, there's too much to lose. I can't do this. There's too much to lose. What profit a man if he gained the whole world but lose his own soul? What will man give in exchange for his soul? Well, Felix was willing to in exchange for his soul, he was not willing to give up his position. But notice what Paul preached. I love this. First of all, Paul preached and reasoned of righteousness. That word reason there means debate. It means to persuade. Amen. So Paul was talking to Felix, not like from behind a pulpit. He was reasoning with him about these things. He reasoned to him of righteousness. Amen. Which in the Hebrew is the Hebrew word sedek. And in the Greek is the word dikaia or dikaios. Dikaios. Purity of heart. Rectitude of life. Of being and doing right. Amen. The righteousness or justice of God. Due to his divine holiness applied in our hearts, turning us, translating us from dead in sin to alive in him. Praise God. The very thing that governments are to employ to be moral. The very thing our laws are based upon. Righteousness is to be one of the domains of the law of this land, but it must be ministered by righteous judges. Amen. Hallelujah. Righteousness is an attribute of God. And also it is a habitation of the believer in Christ Jesus who has the righteousness of God imputed to his heart. Amen. Praise God. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. The righteousness which is of faith in Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Hallelujah. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And I say, praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. But Paul also talked to Felix about temperance. Well, what is temperance? It's holiness. It's the righteousness. It is the justice of God. It is his divine holiness applied to our heart and to our life. Amen. And as far as nations are concerned, applied to moral government and the domain of law. Amen. God is holy. And believers who are in Christ Jesus are also made holy. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. But Paul wasn't through. He talked to Felix about the judgment to come. And this is where Felix began to tremble. Speaking of the last judgment, speaking particularly of the white throne judgment of which the apostle John gives us a clue what this white throne judgment is going to be like. 
Well, it's the last great judgment. Hallelujah. And if it is the judgment of all unsaved men of all ages. And its basis is on works, the works of man. Hallelujah. And John said this, all who are not found in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire. This judgment is called the second death. And what does this mean? It means the final and the complete cutting off from God's presence and a sin cleansed universe in whom God will remember no more. Think about the, the think about the comparison. When we come to Christ and we repent of sin and we ask Christ to come into our heart and life and we receive new birth, all past sins God chooses not to remember anymore. But for those who refuse to bow their knee to Jesus Christ and who die in sin will await this judgment to come. And when these men, unsaved men, are cast into the lake of fire, God will choose to remember them no more. My friend, what an awful finality to a person's life. So I encourage you, if you're a sinner today listening to this broadcast, tremble like Felix trembled. Give your heart to Jesus. He'll make you a brand new person inside. And you will have a future and you will have a hope. Amen. Listen to this. This is, comes in Acts chapter 20. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Amen. What a testimony. And I trust that each and every one of us will be able at the end of our life, will be able to give this same testimony. Praise God. Now, Ephesians 4, 24. What does Paul tell us? To, that we are to put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And then Paul writing to the Roman church says this, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Praise God. All right. Now to finish this chapter, verses 26 and 27. Now Felix hoped also that money would be given to him of Paul that he might loose him. Wherefore, he sent for him the oftener and communed with him. I tell you, Felix, man, he was a politician, but he was just as corrupt as all the rest of them. But after two years, Porcius Festus, Porcius Festus came into Felix's room and Felix, willing to show the Jews the pleasure, left Paul bound. I'm telling you, there is a day to come. There is a righteousness to be reckoned with. Amen. But there's always justice. God will always judge and do what's right. Father, we bless you today. We thank you for this message concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ, that everyone with them, my, the sound of my voice will hear it and respond to it. And we believe that, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if you were to die today, that you would be prepared for heaven? If you're not sure, then I encourage you to pray this prayer with me. Father God, I come to you through your Son, Jesus Christ. I repent and ask you to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I surrender my heart and life to you. By faith, I believe I receive you as my Lord and Savior, and I thank you for receiving me in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed this prayer and desire to know more about the gift of Christ that the Heavenly Father offers you, then email us at rbtc86 at gmail.com. We will be glad to answer your questions promptly and provide you at your request with materials that will help you to grow in your faith in the Lord Jesus. 
This is Patsy Dunning. Thank you for listening to our broadcast today. And let me remind you to tune in to this station at the same time next week to hear more of the wonderful words of life. God bless you and remember what Jesus said. It is the Spirit who gives life.